In Acts 1, we have this terrible memory of Judas, someone that everybody thought was a disciple, but he was a traitor, someone who did not really know Christ, someone who betrayed Christ. Then in Acts 2, we have this great sermon on the day of Pentecost where 3,000 people repent and are, are baptized. But we have to ask ourselves the question, could there be a Judas in that group? If there was a traitor among the 12, how many people among 3,000 may not be true disciples, true followers of Christ? Well, we can ask ourselves, what are the marks of true repentance? What are the marks that we see um, in, in the Scripture itself? One mark of true repentance is that you recognize the gospel. What do I mean by recognize the gospel? You believe that the gospel is true and you believe the gospel has something to do with you. If someone tells me that Immanuel Kant was born on, in 1724, I say, that's true. But what does it have to do with me? Well, if someone who says Jesus of Nazareth died in Jerusalem in the first century AD, we don't just recognize that that's true, but we realize this has something to do with me. This has something to do with my death, my life, my eternity. So a person who's truly repenting believes the claims, believes the facts, and recognizes that the facts have something to do with us. That's why in verse 37 they say, what are we supposed to do? As a result of this, that's a, sign, that's a sign of repentance. Also, the emotions are affected. Now, obviously, we don't spend a lot of time talking about emotions because a person can be emotional without really being truly converted. Um, Esau was emotional. Even Judas was emotional. He killed himself but he wasn't converted. But emotions really are a part of, of conversion. It says that in verse 37, they were pierced to the heart. Their heart was, was affected. If we think about what repentance is, maybe it's helpful, first of all, to understand what repentance is not. I don't know in Russian how you make this distinction, but in in English, we talk about things that are similar, but they're different. One is remorse. Remorse means we feel bad about it. The other is repentance. Now, repentance can include remorse, but repentance goes much deeper than remorse. The book of Hebrews said that uh, Esau tried to get Isaac to change his mind with tears. Esau was crying about his stupid choice of giving up his birthright to his brother. But Esau never really repented. We don't have any, any evidence of his repentance. Uh, Saul, King Saul, he was sorry for the way he treated David, but he never really repented. And he remained an enemy of David to the end. So repentance is not just if you're able to cry or, or feel bad about your sins. Repentance is more than that. Repentance is a change of perception. That is, repentance is a change of the way you see things, the way you look at things. Before I became a Christian, I looked at the world and I looked at my life very, very differently than I do now. That's a part of what it means to change my mind. Repentance is a change of, of uh, perspective. I also change sides. I'm on a different side now. I'm on Christ's side. Before I became a Christian, before I repented, I was on the world's side. And we already mentioned this. Repentance is a change of paths. It's, it's the change of direction. I was going one way. Now I'm going another way. 
Repent and be baptized. Okay, remember, two great errors to avoid. One error, and they're opposite errors, but they land us in the same place. They land us in a place of being wrong, dangerously wrong. One error says it's baptism that saves you. You can't be saved unless you're baptized. That's an error. The other error says, well, you don't need to be baptized because baptism doesn't save you. That's also an error. No, uh, some people think, well, if baptism doesn't save me, then it's optional. It doesn't matter. No, it's not optional. It doesn't save you, but it's not optional. It does matter. No commandment is optional. Let me tell you a quick story. When the children of Israel were traveling in the Sinai Desert, God gave them certain laws. Some of those laws had to do with staying clean. Some of the laws had to do with what you did if you had a certain symptom. Let's say you had a sore. What color is the sore? Is there anything running out of the sore? What are you supposed to do? Some of the laws had to do with what, the, what you did with the clothes of a sick person, even washing the clothes or burning the clothes. And God gave the children of Israel these commandments. Now, here's what, what he, here's what he did not tell the children of Israel. He did not tell them about the connection between disease and dirt. He didn't tell them about the connection between an infection and microorganisms, bacteria, which will make you sick. He didn't tell them that if you'll wash and clean the wound, you will remove the bacteria. He didn't explain any of that to them. Now, there was a man, if you come to Budapest today, you will see a name in lots of places. You will see this name on streets. You will see this name on schools. Mainly, you will see this name on hospitals. It is the name Ignaz Simmelweis. It's actually a German name because he lived in the 19th century when Hungary was ruled by the Habsburg Empire and the official language was German. But he was a Hungarian. He was a great doctor. That's why so many hospitals are named Simmelweis Korhaz, the Simmelweis Hospital. Simmelweis died in an asylum for the insane. He lost his mind. He went crazy and he died. Do you know why? He worked at the baby hospital in Vienna and he noticed something. He noticed that when the doctors did not wash their hands between procedures, the mortality rate was 10 times higher. In other words, he knew that the reason the babies were dying was because the doctors were not washing their hands. And he tried to convince the doctors of that, and they wouldn't listen because he knew he was right and they wouldn't listen and he knew that babies were dying because they wouldn't listen to him, he lost his mind. It drove him crazy. And then he died. Why am I saying this? Well, over 3,000 years earlier, God was telling the children of Israel if you get sick in a certain way, you've got to wash everything. You've got to wash everything. But he didn't teach them about microorganisms. He didn't teach them about bacteria and infection. He just said, do what I say. As late as the 19th century, physicians in a place like Vienna did not understand the connection between being dirty and dying that you've got to wash everything. So, in the physical world, God tells us to do things, 
but he doesn't always tell us the reason. He just says, do it. And we don't understand the reason. Baptism is like that. Why should I be baptized? What's the reason to be baptized? Actually, we're told to do two physical things. One thing is a picture of our entrance into life, this new life. How do we get into this new life? Well, we die to the old life, our sins are washed away, and we're resurrected to the new life. Well, baptism is a picture of that. What do you do with a dead person? I became a Christian in June 1971. The old Ronnie Stevens died. What do you do with a dead person? Well, you bury him. We're buried in baptism, but we're not just buried. We receive a new life, a resurrection life. When I baptize somebody, I don't take them underwater and say, well, now let's all sing a hymn. Or this reminds me of a story. Or, you know, C.S. Lewis once said, no, 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 no. I take them out of the water immediately. We die to the old life, but we receive a new life. Baptism is a picture of that. And our sins are washed away. Baptism is obviously a picture of that. But we don't know all the reasons God tells us to be baptized. Just like the children of Israel didn't know all the reasons why they should wash off if they got sick in certain ways. Even the doctors in Vienna didn't know how important that was in the 19th century. It's interesting that the devil sometimes understands how important things are before Christians do. If you live in a Muslim country under Sharia law and a Muslim becomes a Christian, a member of his family has the responsibility, responsibility to kill him. Did you know that? But they don't really have to kill him until he's baptized. It's when you're baptized, that's when they kill you. If a young man in an Orthodox Jewish family says he's a Christian, everybody's mad. But they don't write you out of the will. They don't take your inheritance away. They don't treat you like you're dead until you're baptized. There's a power in baptism. It's not magic. But there's something spiritually important about doing what God tells us to do. Jesus, Peter said, repent. That's something that happens on the inside. Repent and be baptized. That's something that happens on the outside. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If we refuse to be baptized, we distort the preaching of the... Uh, Apostles, we amputate. You know what amputate is? That's like when you cut your arm off. That's amputation. We amputate gospel obedience. We say, I'm not going to be obedient in that way. I'm going to cut off this part of our my obedience. We abuse the grace of God. Yes, we are saved by grace. No, we're not saved because we're baptized. But we abuse the principle of grace if we say, because I'm saved by grace, I'm not going to obey the commandments. No commandment is optional. Every commandment demands obedience. We're given forgiveness of sins, it says in verse 38, and we're given the promise of the Holy Spirit. Peter says, for the promise is for you and your children. Be saved from this perverse generation. Now look at verse 41. This is an obvious, this is a, a wonderful, wonderful verse. Those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Now, verse 42 is a great verse about the life of the church. What is the church? What is the church supposed to do? Verse 38 is a great verse about salvation. What do we do to be saved? Verse 42 is a verse which addresses the question, what do we do after we are saved? There is a division of systematic theology called ecclesiology. Ecclesiology is the study of the church. 
all books, all essays, all studies of ecclesiology talk about Acts 2.42. All studies of the church emphasize Acts 2.42. What did, the, what did the early church do? What did the first century church do? You know, we have a river in the middle of North America. The last place I lived in America was in Memphis, Tennessee, and it was, Memphis, Tennessee is a city on the banks of that river. It has a funny name which we took from the Indians, and the name is Mississippi. In America, at least, that river starts in Minnesota, and that river ends in New Orleans, where it empties out into the Gulf of Mexico. If you're going to take a drink of water from the Mississippi River, you'd be much better off to get a drink of water in Minnesota than to get a drink of water in New Orleans. Why? because a river is always purer at its source than at its mouth. We call the end of a river its mouth in English. A river is always purer at the place it begins than the place it ends because it picks up impurities. The church is in pretty bad shape in 2010. If we're going to learn what the church should be, we'd be much better off studying the church at the beginning than studying the church in 2010. And that's why it's so wonderful that Luke gives us these little snapshots of the church in the book of Acts. And in Acts 2.42, we're told uh, four things that the church did. Four things that the church were devoted to. The church was devoted to the apostles' teaching. The doctrine which came from Christ to the apostles, through the apostles, to the church. Now there are many things that are being taught in churches today which are no part of the, uh, the apostles' teaching. They're part of man's teaching, human doctrines, not the doctrines of God. If you look at Jude, verse 3, there's only one chapter in the book of Jude. Jude, verse 3, talks about the faith that was once delivered to the saints. The word faith there doesn't mean the trust that I exercise. The word faith there means the truth that I believe. I can say, I have faith in God, that's something I do. I can say the Christian faith, that's a body of doctrine. Jude 3 is talking about the body of doctrine. The faith which was once delivered to the saints, to Christians, through the apostles. The believers in the church in Jerusalem at the beginning were devoted to the apostles' doctrine. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. In the Church of Jesus Christ today, um, we've gotten away from the Bible. Now we're interested in methods. How can we build a big church? How can we have a program that will be attractive so that a lot of people will come to our church? This is the situation in the West. So that the emphasis in the church has become entertainment, or the emphasis in the church has become helping people, or the emphasis in the church has become social concern or social justice. Now, I'm all for enjoyable worship music, and I'm all for helping people, and I'm all for social justice. But it's the apostles' teaching which must stay in the center. God's Word, what Jesus taught, what the truth means. Don't despise doctrine. Don't despise the truth. Jesus said, 
you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. I get letters all the time from people who want help and they want help. I got a letter day before yesterday from a mother who was concerned about her son. And I said to him, I, I wrote this mother back and I said, don't worry about what he does. Worry about what he believes. Don't try to change what he does. It won't work. Try to change what he believes. Try to impact his belief system. What you do will be determined by what you believe. They were devoted to what the apostles taught. They were, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to fellowship. They stayed together. They worked things out together. In 1976, I spent the summer in Israel. I lived in a kibbutz on the Jordan, on the Sea of Galilee at the place where the Jordan River flows into the Sea of Galilee to the south. I was 25 years old. It was my last summer as a single person. I got married the next March. I had a great time. I had a fabulous time. I, I studied Hebrew every day. I spoke Hebrew every day. I saw the Sea of Galilee every day. I swam in the Sea of Galilee. I swam in the Jordan River. The first person I ever baptized, I baptized in the Jordan River. I saw the place where Jesus walked every day. And do you know what? Every day, I, I went backwards in the Christian faith. I lost ground. I became weaker and weaker and weaker as a Christian. Do you know why? Because I was by myself. There were not any Christians. I was the only Christian on the kibbutz. And I had to work on Sunday. There was a church 12 kilometers away, but I could not get there on time on Sunday because I had to work on Sunday morning while they were having church. So there were no Christians on my kibbutz. I could not make it to church on Sunday. Even though I studied the Bible every day, even though I prayed every day, even though I saw the places where Jesus walked every day, I was losing ground, losing ground, losing ground, losing ground every day. Why? Because I was alone. You can't do it alone. You can't do it by yourself. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and value your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. I have a friend who's a pastor in Sweden. He was cross-country skiing with his children. They came to a big, huge tree, and his, the son said to the father, Dad, I can't even get my arms around this tree. The father said, I want to show you something. He called the family over to the tree. The mother was there. The two sisters were there. The little boy was there. And the father said, now stand around the tree. And the father said, now let's all hold hands. So they all held hands. And while they were holding hands, they could all get their arms around the tree as a family. No one member of the family could get his arms around the tree. Now, that's a silly, obvious illustration, but it's a very profound illustration, and it's a very important illustration. The things we face in the Christian life, the challenges we have, we can't meet these challenges alone. We need each other. We need the church. The church is in bad shape, terrible shape, but the church is still the church. Christ still died for the church. The church is still Christ's body. When we talk about how terrible the church is, that's like saying, you know, the girl that Jesus is going to marry is really ugly. You don't really want to say that, do you? 
That's not a smart thing to say. The reality is, by the day he marries her, he will make her beautiful. He will make her beautiful. And the day he marries her, she will be beautiful. That's the situation we're facing here when we think about the church and all the problems in the church. But here's what you remember, what you must remember. If you see the problem in the church, then it's your responsibility to do something about it. You know, we can't solve a problem if we don't know it exists. So we see a problem in the church and we go away. We say, I'm not going to go to the church anymore because um, these terrible things are going on down in the church. Well, if you see the problem, maybe you're part of the solution. Besides, you are the church. If you're a Christian, you can't get away from the, the church because you are the church. What if you're a soldier? And what if there's a great battle going on? And what if you say, I love my country? What if you say, you know what? We're not fighting well. Looks to me like we're going to lose this battle. I think I'm going to go home. Is that an admirable thing to do? You don't fight and help because the others are not fighting well? You don't fight and help because you believe the battle is lost? Is that the way a soldier fights who's supposed to love his country? You know, we don't fight the battle for the church because we love the church. We fight the battle for the church because we love Christ. Because we love our captain. Because we love our general. I can tell you more stories about terrible things in the church than any experience you've ever had. You can tell me the worst experience you've ever had in the church, and I'll guarantee you I can tell you a worse experience because I'm older, because I've been putting up with the church for a long, long time, and because I've been to lots of churches, and because I know lots of pastors, and I know lots of terrible stories. But that's no reason, just because we're not fighting well, just because it looks like we're losing the battle, that doesn't mean we throw our gun down and we run away. No, 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 no. We pick our gun up, we take our position, and we do the right thing, even if other people are not doing the right thing. Somebody's got to do the right thing. Somebody's got to start doing the right thing. Somebody's got to stand for the truth. Christ loves His church. And if Christ loves the church, then that's reason enough for me to love the church. If Christ gave His life for the church, then that's reason enough for me to give my life for the church. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching and they were devoted to the fellowship. They were devoted to staying, they were devoting to meeting in the church. Hebrews 10, 25 says, don't stop meeting together. You know, sometimes we can go and we can say, this isn't doing any good. I didn't get anything out of that. How many times have I ever heard that? You go to a meeting of the church and you say, I didn't get anything out of that. What if a building is on fire? And what if the fireman goes to try to put the fire out, but he, he quits and he goes away. He says, you know, I didn't get anything out of that. I didn't get anything out of that experience. Well, you weren't supposed to get anything out of it. You were supposed to put something into it. It's our responsibility when we worship. It's what we bring. It's not what we take away. When the children of Israel went to the tab tabernacle or the temple, they brought something that they offered, that they killed and they burned for God. And so they lost something at the church. They didn't get something out of worship. They lost something in worship. So the great question is not what do we get, but what do we give? This is true throughout the Bible. And they were devoted to meeting together.
Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.